Namo tassa bhagavato arhato samma sambandhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arhato samma sambandhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arhato samma sambandhasa So welcome everybody to this week's Dhamma Talk. Today we're going to take a look at some suttas involving King Pasedini Pasenadi Kosala. So Kosala, normally we say King Kosala, and Kosala is the kingdom of which he was king. His name, his given name was Pasenadi. Now, Kosala was a kingdom that was west of Magadha. Magadha was the kingdom that I includes Bodh Gaya in the modern day Patna. It became the capital of Ashoka's empire in later times. And Kosala would, would have been the other major power. They were probably the two major powers at the time of the Buddha, Kosala and Magadha. And it was to the northwest of Magadha. And it included, it, it included Savati, where the Buddha spent many of his reigns retreats. It also included Kapilavatu. So the Sakyan country had actually come under, come under control of the kingdom of Kosala during the Buddha's time. So it seems it was something like a, a vassal state. So they wouldn't have completely lost their independence, but they would have been paying, paying taxes to the kingdom of Kosala. So it was a rather, a rather large kingdom. Now there's one entire Sangyutta. So Sangyutta Nikaya, we translate as the linked discourses of the Buddha. And there's a whole, there's a whole section of suttas that are addressed to King Kosala. And we're going to have a look at a few of them today. Um, he's a bit of a comic character. Most of the time when he approaches the Buddha, you can ex- expect something funny to happen. He has some, some kind of um, general spiritual insight. Then he comes, and instead of asking a question from the Buddha, he he tells the Buddha this, and then listens to what the Buddha says. Um, and there's a sutta where he's passing judgment, passing judgment in his halls, and he he throws down the gavel and he said, "Enough of this." You know, these people, they're so rich and they keep coming here to the court and they keep telling lies and lies and lies for the sake of their own, their own material benefit. I've had enough of it. And, but even though he has that sort of character, he's sort of tired of other people's lies and everything. And obviously he's interested in spirituality. He does become a disciple of the Buddha. But there are many stories of bad things that he did. And so there were purges that he did. He had people killed. Uh, he tried to take the the wife the wife of one of his subjects in one of the Dhammapada stories. Uh, a lot of different uh, negative things that he also has done. So he was definitely not um, sort of a flawless character. So, uh, but in the Kosala Sangyutta that we're going to be looking at today, a lot of the suttas are involving issues that specifically relate to people who are sort of living a lay life. There's not a lot of stuff about meditation, but we can get we can get some important lessons from it and some things that actually do influence our meditation. And so the first of these suttas we're going to look at is called the Satyajatila Sutta. So a jatila is a certain kind of religious person. Sometimes they translate it as ascetics, but we can say like a mm, so a wandering mendicant is another way to translate it. The jatilas were the ones who had these long dreadlocks, and in India today still, you can see that some of the mendicants have their hair all, all done up in these dreadlocks. Uh, sometimes that they're all, all bound around their head like a turban. Sometimes they might be hanging down. And 
So well, let's read the sutta. We're going to follow for all the suttas today. We're going to follow Ajahn Sujato's translations. Ajahn Sujato's done the translations on suttacentral.net, and he's made them all available without without copyright. At one time, the Buddha was staying near Savati, in the stilt longhouse of Migara's mother in the eastern monastery. Then, in the late afternoon, the Buddha came out of retreat and sat outside the gate. Then King Pasenadi of Kosala went up to the Buddha, bowed, and sat down to one side. Now at that time, seven matted hair ascetics, seven Jain ascetics, seven naked ascetics, seven one-cloth ascetics, and seven wanderers passed by, not far from the Buddha. Their armpits and bodies were hairy, and their nails were long, and they carried their stuff with their shoulder poles. Then King Pasenadi got up from his seat, arranged his robe over one shoulder, knelt with his right knee on the ground, raised his joined palms towards those various ascetics, and pronounced his name three times. Sirs, I am Pasenadi, King of Kosala. Then, soon after those ascetics had left, Pasenadi went up to the Buddha, bowed, and sat down to one side and said to him, Sir, are they coming among those in the world who are perfected ones or who are on the way path to perfection? Great king, as a layman enjoying sensual pleasures, living at home with your children, using sandalwood imported from Kasi, wearing garlands, fragrance, and makeup, and accepting gold and currency, it's hard for you to know who is perfected or on the path to perfection. You can get to know a person's ethics by living with them, but only after a long time, not casually, only when attentive, not when inattentive, and only by the wise, not the witless. You can get to know a person's resilience in times of trouble. You can get to know a person's wisdom by discussion, but only after a long time, not casually, only when attentive, not inattentive, and only by the wise, not by the witless. It's incredible, sir, it's amazing how all this was said by the Buddha. Sir, these are my spies, my undercover agents, returning after spying on the country. First they go undercover, then I have them report to me. And now, when they have washed off the dust and dirt, they are nicely bathed and anointed, with hair and beard dressed, and dressed in white. They will amuse themselves, supplied and provided with the five kinds of sensual stimulation. Then, understanding this matter, on that occasion the Buddha recited these verses. It's not easy to know a man by his appearance. You shouldn't trust them at first sight, for undisciplined men live in this world disguised as the disciplined, like a fake earring made of clay, like a copper halfpenny covered with gold. They live hidden in the world, corrupt inside, but impressive outside. So we have a plot, a plot here. Now this sutta actually occurs in a different, a different place as well. And normally other translators have translated this as a statement that King Kosala makes. Bhante, these surely are ascetics who have attained enlightenment, something like that. Here, Ajahn Sujato has translated it as a question. And I presume that's because in, in Pali grammar, there are different ways of making questions. So perhaps that he has interpreted the sentence that way. In the other sutta, it's actually framed as a question, so there's a difference in the, in the two. So he sent out this group, and it lists seven different kinds of, of religious groups. So one of the groups are the naked ascetics, and one are these ascetics who are wearing their hair in, in these dreadlocks. And so he set out seven groups of seven of them to spy in the countryside. So he set out, he set out fake monks, right? He set up fake monks to find out what's going on amongst the people because people aren't so, shouldn't be so suspicious about the monks because they know, oh, well, they're not using money. So they, and they're not getting married. And so they, they won't, they won't be able to harm us. But these are fake monks. So they're going to go and they're going to find out the, the secrets of the people. And then they'll report to King Kosala. And then maybe they get a knock on the door from the secret police later. So not only are they not, they're not holy men. They're probably not that great people anyway. So, um, so of course that tells us something about King Basenidi, but we can see here, uh, the Buddha talks about four criteria for getting to know a person's qualities. 
And the final verse, he says, he talks about people who are, who look very grand on the outside, but they're corrupt on the inside. So what are the criteria, the four criteria that he mentions? So let's review them here. So you can get to know a per- person's ethics by living with them. So we get to know somebody, their behavior by living with them and not for a short time, right? Only over a longer period of time. And we don't, we, we don't get to know this if we're not paying attention. So only if we are attentive to this kind of thing will we be able to understand the, this quality of the, of the people we're living with. You can get to know a person's purity by dealing with them. Okay, so like by doing business with somebody. You can know a person's resilience in time of trouble by living with them for a long time. And see, you can get, sorry, he's translated in in an unusual way. You can get to know a person's resilience by observing them in times of trouble over a long time. Okay, so you can't, you can't tell if somebody's honest or not if you're not dealing with them like in business. So somebody might be very, uh, they might have gentle speech, they might appear to be a kind person, but when you do business with them, they might be doing all kinds of underhanded things. And regarding resilience, you know, somebody might appear to be quite a good person, but they may have this fault that when the times get tough, you can't rely on them. And so the way to the way to find that out is to associate with somebody for a longer period of time and observe how they behave in times of difficulty. You can judge their resilience. And you can get to know the wisdom by discussion. So by discussing with somebody, you can understand their understanding of the world and specifically by asking questions, right? So you ask questions of somebody and you can ask them in you can ask the questions in different ways and try to see what sorts of perspectives that person brings to an issue. Now, we don't expect people to have perfect answers, but we can see the kinds of approaches they use because somebody might have good knowledge, but their reasoning about it might not be that great. Or somebody may have very, very clear reasoning, but their knowledge might not be very good. Another person may have some kind of a very good practical knowledge, but they're not very eloquent. So some people, you can think, especially in older times when we didn't have like an equal education system, you can think of parents who had to raise their children um, to take over a trade or something like that. And the parents may have been illiterate, but they may be very competent in managing a household. And so such people wouldn't be able to engage in arguments, but they would teach their, their children by example. Maybe they would use, like, for example, fairy tales and things like that to, to show, to display principles to them. Or they put them into situations where the children would have to learn a lesson, a lesson about honesty or a lesson about the character of other people. So we have these four criteria for judging, judging the qualities of other, of other people. Now, the Buddha is talking here about uh, judging whether somebody is enlightened or not. So technically, if you're not an enlightened person, you're not going to be capable of understanding whether someone is enlightened or not. I, I believe in one of our other talks, I'm not sure it was recorded, and in one of our other talks we talked about the qualities of an arahant. An arahant is developed in four ways. They say bhavita kaya. So they're bodily behavior is developed in the sense that they have restrict, they have, uh, they're not disturbed by the, the different senses, by the eye, what, what comes in through their senses. Bhavita sila, or bhavita sila means that their conduct, the conduct, especially towards other people, has been developed. Bhavita citta, so their concentration is developed. In bhavita panya, the wisdom has been completely developed. And so, uh, we talked a little bit about that as the qualities of an arahant. But today, I want to talk about something a little left, some some things that are a little less lofty. So, so that the first lesson we're getting from King Kosala is about judging people from appearances, 
and and that if we want to actually judge, it will take time, it takes attentiveness, and we have to see that person in different sorts of situations before we can judge. The second sutta, as I said, King Kosula is a rather common character, and the second sutta is kind of like a classic, a classic King Kosula sutta. And this one, probably lots of you know, it's called the Donapaka Sutta. So we'll go to that one. Now at that time, King Pasenadi of Kosala used to eat rice by the pot. Then, after eating, King Pasenadi of Kosala went up to the Buddha, huffing and puffing. He bowed and sat down to one side. Then, knowing that King Pasenadi was huffing and puffing after eating, on that occasion the Buddha recited this verse, When a man is always mindful, knowing moderation in eating, his discomfort fades, and he ages slowly, taking care of his life. Now at that time, the student Sudasana was standing behind the king. Then King Pasenadi addressed him, Please, dear Sudasana, memorize this verse in the Buddha's presence and recite it to me whenever I am protected, presented with a meal. I'll set up a regular daily allowance of a hundred dollars for you. Yes, your majesty, replied Sudasana. He memorized that verse in the Buddha's presence, and then whenever the king was presented with a meal, he would repeat it. When a man is always mindful, knowing moderation in eating, his discomfort fades and he ages slowly, taking care of his life. Then the king gradually got used to having at most a cup of rice. After some time, King Prince Pisanity's body slimmed right down. Stroking his limbs with his hands, at that time he expressed this, this heartfelt sentiment. In both ways the Buddha has sympathy for me, in the good of the present life and the good of the next. So the Buddha's given him weight loss advice. So this is always considered one of the funnier suttas. And it's also the same story is told in the Dhammapada commentary to uh, a Dhammapada verse about health being the highest gain. So of course, if we don't have our health, it's we can't really enjoy the other parts of life. And if you've ever been sick and tried to meditate, then you know that it's quite important to to maintain a good level of health in order to develop your meditation. Of course, there are certain qualities that we learn from sickness, like patient, patience and effort. But to develop your concentration, it's, it's necessary to have a certain degree of health. Now, it's not just a funny story. Okay, so King Kosala lost weight and it's a happy story. But how he does it isn't important. And it's important to realize that he is investing trust in his, in one of his servants, this young Brahmin, Sudasana. And he has asked him to do something that's not that easy. And that is to recite a certain verse uh, about the benefits of moderation in eating while he's eating. And so in the other place in the Dhammapada commentary, they explain about this that what he would do is when the when there was one more mouthful left. So they remember in um, in those days they would eat food. It seems that it was a slightly was some kind of variety of sticky rice and so they would make it into a ball of rice and they would mix it with the curry and they would take them in mouthfuls. And so they would measure how much food you eat by a certain number of mouthfuls. And so this Brahmin this, this young man would count how much the king has eaten. And then when he was about to finish, maybe one or two mouthfuls before finishing, he would recite this verse and the king would stop. And the next day he would secretly ask the cook to prepare less food. And so again, when he was just a few mouthfuls before, before finishing, he would ask him to stop. And so in this way, it was easier for the king not to, uh, not to eat eat so much. Now, this strategy, you see, it, it actually requires a certain amount of, even though it sounds like he's, he's getting some help, but it still requires a lot of discipline. Of course, the king would have felt hungry. 
But notice how he's done this. He's asked the, he's asked the Brahmin to remind him of the benefits of of his behavior right at that time. So we talk about, for example, if somebody, I don't know if they do this now, but in, in past days when someone was trying to quit smoking, uh, they would they would try to change the schedule of their smoking. So they would measure when they would, they would give them a timer and then the person could only smoke when the timer rang. And so they made the timer ring like at really inconvenient times. They'd have to wake up in the middle of the night and smoke or something like that. And so eventually they got, they would in theory get sick of smoking. So this is an opposite. This is sort of the opposite strategy from that. This is reflecting on the benefits of losing weight. And so he's, he's given him this, this verse uh, on, on the benefits of that. So it's kind of a funny sutta, but it, it does remind us that when we want to change a behavior, it sometimes is helpful to, to do this, to use the strategy. So we can take a verse, we can, um, we can write a verse or something like that, and we can put it up where we can see it and to remind ourselves of, of the benefits of what we're doing, to give ourselves encouragement. So we can't always we can't always have a servant behind us to remind us when, whenever we need it. So we have to learn to encourage ourselves to do what we are trying to do. Um, so the last one. So those two suttas were a little bit funny. The last one's not really a funny sutta. It's a meditation on death, and it's also another very famous sutta uh, involving King Kosala. And it is the story of the mountain, Pava Dupama Sutta, the, the, the simile of the mountain. So we'll read that sutta um, briefly. King Pasenadi of Kosala, at Savati, King Pasenadi of Kosala sat to one side, and the Buddha said to him, So, great king, where are you coming from in the middle of the day? Sir, there are anointed aristocratic kings who are infatuated with authority and obsessed with greed for sensual pleasures. They have attained stability in the country, occupying a vast conquered territory. To today I have been busy fulfilling the duties of such kings. What do you think, great king? Suppose a trustworthy and dependable man were to come from the east. He'd approach you and say, Please, great king, you should know this. I come from the east. There I saw a huge mountain that reached the clouds, and it was coming this way, crushing all creatures. So then, great king, do what you must. Then a second trustworthy and dependable man were to come from the west, a third from the south, from the north, a fourth from the south. He'd approach and say, Please, great king, you should know this. I come from the south. There I saw a huge mountain that reached to the clouds, and it was coming this way, crushing all creatures. So then, great king, do what you must. Should such a dire threat arise, a terrible loss of human life, when human birth is so rare, what would you do? Sir, what could I do but practice the teachings, practice morality? doing skillful and good actions. I tell you, great king, I announce to you, old age and death are advancing upon you. Since old age and death are advancing upon you, what would you do? Sir, what can I do but practice the teachings, practice morality, doing skillful and good actions? So, the sutta goes on, but that, that's the gist of it. So, King Kosala is, you know, his kingdom is, has become stable and kings in those days, essentially they were, they were not constrained by rule of law or not very much. And so the kings would be able to do all kinds of things that we would consider completely unethical in those times. 
and they wouldn't be punished for it. They didn't have some of these, they didn't have like a common religion or something like that that would restrain the behavior of kings. And so the Buddha asks him what he's been doing. He says, well, I've been doing what, you know, whatever rich guys do, whatever kings do when they don't have other stuff to do. And so then the Buddha is reminding him of aging sickness and death. And he says, given the preciousness of human life, if there were a mountain, mountains coming at you from the four directions, and it would seem that death is certain, what would you do? And, and so he says, well, I would, I would practice the Dhamma. I would keep my seal. I would be generous. I would meditate. He says, well, it's true that these four mountains are coming. Definitely you will die. And so what should you do? And so reflecting on that, King Kosala uh, says, yes, I should be practicing the Dhamma. I should be meditating. I should be keeping precepts. I should be uh, giving alms, etc." So you can see from these three suttas the nature of King Kosala. He's, you can say he's not very wise. He, he doesn't see solutions to problems very well, but he is very amenable to advice and that's his good quality. So when the Buddha gives a teaching, then he accepts it with gratitude. He's not too proud. He doesn't say, what, do you think I'm an idiot? He, he listens to what the Buddha says, he thinks about it, and then he, then he agrees with the teaching and he tries to follow it. So he, um, in the first sutta, he agrees that these, these, this 49 ascetics that are coming back to the palace, that they're not actually arahants. And he listens to the Buddha's teaching about the four ways that we learn about a person's character. In the second sutta, he listens to the benefits of losing weight. And we can see from the sutta, he comes to the Buddha and he is huffing and puffing. And so normally when we approach the Buddha, we just walk up slowly and bow, right? If you, if you approach a Buddha statue, you go up and you slowly and you bow three times. So presumably that's what he was doing. And even that was too much. He was so overweight. Um, and so he took the advice and he told his he told his Brahmin student to recite those verses for him and he was able to lose weight. And then in the last example, uh, the Buddha points out the heedlessness of his, of his life and King Kosala doesn't become upset. Uh, he reflects on it and he says, yes, it's true. It's true, this life is short and then death is certain, so I should be practicing in accord with the Dhamma. So these are all examples from, these are all suttas from the Kosala Vaga of the Sangyutta Nikaya. Uh, I, various translations are available, but the one on Sutta Central is, is available for free. Uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi has a, probably the most popular translation. He's translated, I think it's called The Connected Discourses of the Buddha. It's available from Wisdom Publications. Ajahn Sujato's translation is available from suttacentral.net. And Kosala Vaga is the third, the third group in the first section, the five section. The first section is Sagata Vaga, a section with verses, and of those, the third section is Kosala Sangyutta. So, if you're ever reading through the suttas and you want something a little bit lighter, so that that might have some some humorous story and not too complicated dhamma, it's a good place to start. So I wish that all of you may be happy, healthy, peaceful, and content, and swiftly attain the peace and nirvana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.